Welcome to Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This is where I get to chat with people who I've connected with over the years in the world of arts and entertainment, and we're starting a brand new series, Guitar Talk. And our very first guest in this series is my hometown friend, Jake Thomas. Welcome to the show, Jake. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, it's certainly my pleasure. Now, I remember you from when I was just a teenager, and some of my older guitar player friends were all about this band called Buster in North Bay. And you, along with Denny Jackson, who was up there from uh, maybe, I think it was Canton, Ohio, or thereabouts. That's exactly right. And yeah. Dave and Johnny Vassos. Now, I don't, was it Ronnie Pratt or, or Steve Clark on drums? Steve Clark on drums, and then uh, Steve left, and then uh, a buddy of mine from Bracebridge, who happened to be living in North Bay, he was a chef, Tommy Hay, ended up being the, the drummer. And uh, a very good singer. He sang like Smokey Robinson. Okay. So that was a smoking band. And like I said, that was the first time I'd ever seen you. And the the tandem between you and Denny, like you guys were playing some stuff that just blew me away. But before all that, at some point as a kid, you were inspired to get into music. So what got you into wanting to play guitar in the first place? Well... (laughs) At our house, like my brother was a huge bluegrass fan, huge, and Chet Atkins and all that, and Merle Travis, and I don't know, it's probably eight or nine, and he had five-string banjo kicking around, a Gibson guitar, and a mandolin, and juice harps, and all kinds of stuff. He was 10 years older, actually 11 years older than I am, and he's still kicking, but when he would go out, I would take out his mandolin and fool around with it or take out his guitar. And I wasn't supposed to unless he was there, but I did it anyway. Then one day I broke a string and, you know, I just strung open strings. I couldn't push anything down at the time. And, but one day I broke a string and I tried to replace it and I did it all backwards. <laughs> it was just a mess. And so he kind of figured out what was going on. So he gave me some lessons and he just taught me about scales, you know, the, there's no B sharp and there's no E sharp and etc. And I just took off with it and then started taking lessons from uh, Russ Smith, who's a great guitar player here in town. And uh, one thing led to another, and really enjoyed it. Just always enjoyed it. You know, it was always on. Your passion really paid off too, because you had before I'd ever even heard of you. You know, before you basically moved back to North Bay, you had already done some pretty uh, awesome things. You played with. Gord Oliver, how did that happen? Well, the whole thing, I went on the road like in 1965, I was 17 years old. And I went on the, the road with this band of buddy, sax player Bruce Burns, and uh, a couple guys from out of town. I don't know how exactly it happened. And we were just not very good, you could say. But we were doing good material. We were doing James Brown stuff, and we were doing some blues stuff. and like, But we just didn't know how to do it. <laughs> But anyway, we ended up, we played the Northern Circuit, you know, the Bud Matten in Timmins today, you're in London tomorrow, back up to Rouen the next week, and back over <laughs> to the next, you know, a lot of mileage. But we learned a lot. We learned a lot. And then, and then that was in February of 65. And by June, the drummer and I ended up in Detroit, going to play some R&B and blues. Then I came back to Canada and hooked up with some guys in North Bay, and we took off to Toronto. They wanted to be stars. I wanted to be a side man. I always that's always what I wanted to do. Just you know, kind of like Bernie, Bernie Labarge, just kind of fit in anywhere. Yeah. So that was called at that time the the four of us we were called the Rifkin. So anyway, we went to Toronto and uh, our manager. We got a manager and they. And us and uh, flowers and all the mod junk. And after a couple months of that, we just, no, this ain't working. So we just ignored everything they said, put on blue jeans and T-shirts, called it Buckstone Hardware. We picked up a bass player from Sudbury. So it was five-piece. Now the original bass player, turns out, was a, quite a good piano player and guitar player. So it, he was versatile that way. So then we had Buckstone Hardware, and we were known as the uh, jukebox hit makers. We, we couldn't get airplay on Chum because it was a little too country for them, even though it was loud and schmangy. And Jeff Beck was one of our main influences at the time, and Led Zeppelin and Jimmy. Well, Led Zeppelin wasn't even around then. They came 
they came to the rock pile shortly after we had turned into Buckstone Hardware. And anyway, that went on for a while, and then that kind of imploded, and it hooked up with some other guys from Sudbury for Air and Space, and Bob DeSalle, who ended up playing with Bruce Coburn for quite a few years, and Gene Thalbo, who's still in Toronto. And we did that for a while. They put out a record on Warner Brothers, didn't do anything. And then I got a call from an old buddy from Hamilton when I'd been fooling around in southern Ontario, uh, John Alexa, and he was playing bass with George Oliver. And he said, come on out, check it out. We need a guitar player. So I went out and I checked it out. And we're going on the road with George Oliver. And we did a lot of really nice gigs. He was good to work for. He was well-known and he, you know, he at first, you know, you hear the, the stories about the leaders making more money than the guys in the band. And, you know, the guys in the band are always a little bit gripey about it. But I thought, well, why not? He's getting all the gigs and doing all the work. <laughs> he's quite you the know. showman, that's for sure. He's a great showman. He's a great singer. And he's uh, he's just a good guy. He was good to work for. And I learned a lot from him. When did Bill I, King but, come into the picture? Oh, boy. Well, before I played with... George, a couple of years before, a late friend of mine, he passed away a couple of years ago, Joey McQuillan, uh, was playing with, he had played with George, but he was playing with Bill King at the time. I was playing with George, and Joey had also been in a band called Truck, which was out of London. So I forget exactly the timeline, but I was playing with George, and then Joey and I traded gigs, and I went to move to London for a few months and played with Truck. And then uh, Graham Lear left to go and play with Santana. Just a quick editor's note to clarify, when Graham Lear left the band Truck, he was in Montreal where he hooked up with Gino Vanelli and crew and then was sought out by Santana to join his band. Now back to Jake. And then uh, I went back to Toronto with the tail between my legs and then Zoe was at that time was playing with Bill King. And he said, give it a shot. So somehow or other, because he had been with Truck. And then, <laughs> and then uh, somehow or other, I ended up with Bill King. And we did an album, and it went well. Uh, Dixie Peach, I believe it was called. Right. And Dixie Peach, the album, featured Bill's hit, Blue Skies. Yeah, and, and, you know, we just got along really well with him because he knew what he was doing. You know, like, I was kind of green about business and all that. Yeah, we, we had a good time and uh, played with Bill for probably a year or two, a couple of years. And then went back to George for a while. And then I got married and then got out of Toronto, came back up here. And then didn't play down south much for about 10 years or so. And then started going down south, you know, just kind of going back and forth. And we had a band called, uh, well, it ended up being the Fundamentals or Jake and the Fundamentals because I was the only person that was there all the way through. We went through 30 different people in the band. Wow. It was a, blues, it was a good blues band, and uh, we had all kinds of different. For one season, I guess about a year, not quite a year, uh, the Survivor Band, Les Stroud. He was our singer and front man. And uh, we did the Beaches Festival because Bill King runs the Beaches, or ran, I don't know if he still does. So he booked us there on the street. We played there probably seven, eight, nine years in a row. That's where you sell CDs. Yeah, You're that's selling. a nice gig. Yeah. Yeah, we'd sell like 200 CDs on the street for over three nights. And that's a lot of, you know, at 20 bucks a pot that starts that up. And that's back in, you know, 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, now I think it was Paul Pruno that was singing with you for a while when I heard yeah. I heard something on the radio from Jake and the Fundamentals, I think maybe on Danny Mark's show, Blues FM. Could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so... We did two... Two CDs, two album CDs with Paul. Like, Paul and I have known each other since the uh, oh, 70s, I guess. Yeah, and he's you know, great voice, great singer. Yeah, no and, doubt. Uh, and then that kind of imploded, and then my son ended up singing with the fundamentals. That's something else. You know, I, I, yeah. I envy that, for sure. No, it's totally organic, because I had a little trio going with a great bass player and drummer, and he came out one night, and... The trio was playing, and he sat in and sang a couple songs, and wow, that sounds pretty good. And he joined up, and we, yeah, we rehearsed a bit, and then we just went and started playing, and we tried to call it the High Rollers, but uh, everybody kept calling it the Fundamentals, so 
Jake and the Final Mel. So we just kept that name and we did a CD and did some festivals. Still do a bit of festival stuff, but mainly acoustic, scaled down. Again, uh, a little long in the tooth for running a band and all that stuff. You've had over 60 years in the business, right? Uh, I started playing gigs, yeah, I guess, yeah, when I was about 14, I started in that 60 years ago, yeah. Yeah, well, I've had this conversation with a few people where, you know what, for example, uh, I was one of those kids that was inspired to learn how to play guitar by watching the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show. But, you know, 50 some odd years later, how many times can I sing Hard Day's Night? You know, (laughs) so you got to kind of change things up and, and try different things and, you know, I, my shows nowadays are 90, 90, 95% all original material because, yeah, you yeah, know, and right. I, I respect the guys that, that do covers and do it really well and put in the time and everything else. But for me, after so many years, you just have to change it up, right? Yeah, absolutely. You got to keep moving forward and, you know, trying things, experimenting, different people, whatever. Just keep it interesting, if nothing else. Now, speaking of keeping it interesting... Since we're going to talk guitars here, I know that you've gone through a few, and I remember you primarily as a Strat guy, but uh, when I talked to Bernie Labarge about you, he said that he first saw you playing in 71 or 72 with George yep. Oliver and friends, and you were playing a Les Paul. Yep, yep, and uh, I had that for a few years, but at the same time, I had a tele- I always, I've always had a Telecaster, like I play a Stratocaster, I've got a Telecaster at home. And I've always liked Telecaster. I still got one here. It's kind of uh, weird. It's got humbucker pickups in it, but they're really lightly wound. Hmm. And it sounds like single coil pickups, and it's got a, an incredible sound without the harsh edge of a, a Telecaster, some Telecasters anyway. And I, I don't like using a lot of pedals, so, you know, it compresses because of the pickups. It sounds compressed, you know, it, not an in your face sound. It's a pleasant sound to listen to. Right. You know, it just reminds me, uh, years ago, I don't know if you remember, there used to be a, an alternate um, guitar store in North Bay. I think it was called Jeans 88 on the Main Street. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, uh, it was mainly pianos and that, but yeah, yeah he did sell some guitars. Yeah, yeah. and Johnny Vassos was working there. Um, yeah. And I remember I went in there with, with a friend, and somebody was talking about being worried about their setup on their guitar. And I don't know if the, after the guy left, whatever, John says, you know, everybody's so fussy about their guitars and the neck has to be super straight and everything else. But he said, you know, Jake Thomas's guitar, I looked at that Strat and the neck is like a banana. So, it's, you know, it's, it's not always the guitar so much as the player, but he certainly wrangled some <laughs> funky stuff out of that. Yeah, well, that, that guitar it had a lot of miles on it. Yeah, I think, yeah, that was a Strat that... Once again, along the Queens, and uh, had that for a long time. I don't know. I, I have no idea what ever happened to it. It just kind of went into the mist of time. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> but I've got a Strat now that's quite nice. I was with a friend that bought it. He went to Steve's, and he there was probably, uh, I don't know, 30, 40 Stratocasters, and some of them played nice, and some of them sounded nice, but this was the one that played and sounded good all at once. That's, I guess, it's a, a 1999. Okay. And about five years later, he wanted to sell it. And so I bought it. I knew what it was. It was a good price, and I still have it. It's funny you mentioned that there were so many guitars there, so many Stratocasters to choose from, and only very few that played and sounded nice, because I have a custom-built Tele and a custom-built Strat, because oh, yeah. I've never been able to buy a factory Fender guitar that really did it for me uh, for the long term? Uh, yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, like that's why people get into pedals and that, just to round off the sound or bump it up or whatever. I've always found Stratocasters is like very toneful, very unique sound, like Mark Knopfler, the way he made it work. Yeah. That's kind of an eye-opener, you know? And he did all kinds of stuff, and it's all Strat sound, but it's all different. Yeah, I think that's, that's with the toggle switch on the second position from the neck pickup, right? Yeah, well, back then, too, there was only three-way switch, so you had to kind of edge it into place. Right. You know, and then in the years after that, it changed to, uh, you know, they start putting five-way switches in. Somebody got smart, you know. 
because there's a lot more to the thing about a Telecaster that I like over a Stratocaster is you can do anything with it. Like you can change pickups in and out, and you can you know string bender if you want. Like they're just just a chunk of wood with strings on it. <laughs> you know? Well, it's you know what? It took me years to to figure out because I was always a Gibson guy. Like I, I had the 1963 Gibson SG, and then I bought, um, yeah. I bought a solid body Gibson 335. It was the 335S Professional Deluxe, and that thing, solid. when I bought it, yeah, when I bought it, it was two hundred dollars more than the Les Paul Deluxe right beside it. Beautiful, oh, really? beautiful oh. guitar, but for years I had tuning problems. You know, yeah, and yeah. I didn't understand that it was the headstock design. And when you look at a Fender headstock, which I think is stolen from the Merle Travis headstock, really, uh, it's it's yeah. a better alignment of the strings. So yeah, the Fender guitars, even with the string tree, I guess that they had it right from the beginning, as far as I know. But Bixby used that before that. He made some custom guitars for Merle Travis and Speedy West and all those guys. But that's a design probably from the 1800s with lutes and all that kind of thing, where they put all the tuners on one side from way back. I never even thought about that. Yeah, now I have that picture in my head. It's not a new concept, but Fender kind of put it into a, a modern idea. All the, uh, the magazine articles and, and whatnot that I've seen, they all kind of allude to the fact that Leo Fender stole the design from Merle Travis, but that's very interesting, what you're saying. Uh, Merle Travis, well... I forget Bigsby's first name. The guy, same guy that invented the whammy bar, the Bigsby whammy bar. Mm-hmm. Paul Bigsby. And he was making these guitars, oh, in the late 40s. And he made a, a guitar, an electric guitar for Merle Travis, which had all one side tuners. And I believe that was either right when Fender was coming out or maybe even before. But it was way back there. Every, I guess they were trying a lot of new stuff because electric guitars were basically. 10, 15 years old at that point, like usable. They had the old Rickenbacker pan and all that stuff in the 30s, but it really didn't work. And I guess Charlie Christian, around 39 and 40, he started recording with a, a pickup and a Gibson archtop. And he was really the first guy to sound like a trumpet player playing guitar. But then nothing really came with pickups and that until Gibson and Leo Fenders started coming up with decent things. I think a lot of it was to do with, um, how to put it, fashion trends in, in music, uh, if that makes any sense, like, or popular trends in music, because to give you an example, not too long ago, I inherited three lap steels, and one of them was the old Rickenbacker with the Bakelite plastic body, and yeah. it was pre-World War II, because from what I understand, the, well, the Red Baron... His name was Rickenbacker. And so oh, the, the, oh. the manufacturers of the Rickenbacker lap steel line at the time thought, we're going to change it to Backer, as we know it now. Okay. Um, yeah. And anyway, so we thought that this thing was going to be worth a fortune. And it really wasn't. I think we got $1,000 on eBay for it. Because lap steels today are not very popular. And, right. But they were the thing. In the 40s and the early 50s, it was... Yeah, because you know, Hawaiian music. Hawaiian music was the thing. And yeah. then as guitar started to take over as the popular instrument, then we started to see these innovations that you're talking about. Yeah, you know, between think, Western and in, uh, rock and roll, when rock and roll started. Yeah. You know, Bill Haley and the Comets, all of a sudden the electric guitar became really important. Yeah. And, Oh, it's, it's still important. <laughs> well, yeah, no kidding. And you know what I'm finding is a, I'm, I get a I get a smile on my face when, and I haven't played that many shows since COVID, but you know when you play a live show at a festival or whatever, and you get the young guys coming up and and uh, you know they're just so excited about your guitar playing. I'm like, I would never have guessed that you guys were into this. You know, so it's still important. It's still valid, and that's why we have these conversations. But I wonder, Jake, like I said, I've always kind of known you as a Fender guy, and we know that you did have a Les Paul in the early 70s. Have you always been like Fender and Gibson uh, right down the uh, middle, or, or have you ever wandered off in different directions with the different brands of guitars? Not really. 
Not really. Telecaster's always been kind of the base for electrics. Like, and then the last, what, since so 15 or so years, I've been into acoustic guitars, doing solo stuff. And, yeah, the, that's a totally different world altogether, learning about the woods and whatnot. But uh, Fender and Gibson, yeah, I, mean, I guess basically, but they always got modified for some reason. I, I would take a guitar, no matter what, and change something on it. I don't know, it's just... Uh, Well, it's like I said before about me having to have my Fender style guitars custom built because there's always something about the factory builds that just isn't right for me. Now, I was just thinking about your old bandmate, Denny Jackson, had that Gibson Les Paul, but it had the SG body style. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I I had no idea at that time that was called, like until he had one called the Les Paul. I, I never knew that. I thought they were just SGs. Les Pauls were Les Pauls. But yeah, that was a pretty uh, nifty guitar. He broke the headstock on it, and I think he fixed it, got it fixed. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, he, he loaned that guitar to me one time. It was <laughs> funny story. A buddy of mine, um, my 63 SG was that kind of um, wine red finish Yeah, originally. Yeah, like most of them were. Yeah, and so my buddy says, he shows me a, a picture of Tony Iommi playing the white SG. And he says, oh, yeah. wouldn't yeah. it be cool if we painted your SG white and then you'd have one like Tony Iommi's? And I thought, error, yeah. error. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, huh, well, that sounds pretty cool. Neither one of us had any idea what we were doing. So basically, you ended up destroying the finish on this guitar. And I, I still played it. Like, I still have pictures of me playing the white SG. But while my guitar was being refinished and it was taking forever... I had a couple of gigs coming up, and Denny said to me, well, listen, I will loan you my guitar. If you break it, you bought it. And yeah. I had no idea just how much I, I would have been in debt today if I had to, had to replace it. You know? And the fact that he would loan this kid, like I was, I was 20 maybe. Yeah, and, yeah. And you know, the trust he had in me to loan me this heirloom guitar. Like at the time, it was just worth you know, 500 bucks. Yeah. Today... But- 10 times, 15 times that much. Yeah, you'd have to sell your house to pay for it. The first electric I got was a Gibson Melody Maker with a black pickup, and uh, that threw a Harmony app, sounded like Jimmy Page and Led Zeppelin. It was wonderful. But uh, I don't know if you remember Vic Virgili here in town. He had a country band. Yep. Vic Virgili and the Laurentian Valley Boys. Laurentian Valley Boys, yep. Just a quick editor's note to point out that when Jake talks about people like Russ Smith and Vic Virgili with the Laurentian Valley Boys, he is referring to local to North Bay, Ontario icons. Now back to Jake. He had a a pinball business, and so because of that, he could get stuff wholesale, and there was no Fender dealer in town. So he bought a bunch of us. I know at least five or six of us, Donnie Boston and a bunch of others. You give him 150 bucks, and he would order you a Telecaster from Pete's Distribution in Montreal. Wow. And you had no choice on what you got or whatever. But the very first Telecaster I ever owned, when I was about 14 in grade 9 or 10, it came in, it had a maple fingerboard, and it was chocolate brown, which today would be worth like double what a white one is worth from, what, 1960, 61? And I traded in on a base. <laughs> like, <laughs> How'd no that idea. work out? Yeah, yeah, just no idea. But you know, we all, I'm sure we all went through a lot of stuff back there. It was easy come, easy go, I guess. Yeah, you never place value on your current instrument until you've you know been parted with it for ten or fifteen years, and you start to see them selling for ten or fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or I think I'm selling uh, a couple things right now. And I had to price them, and I, I said, "Really? Like they got a Taylor acoustic that I can apparently I can get fifteen hundred bucks for? I'm not asking that much, but I'm kind of surprised. Yeah, that it's worth that much, you know. Like still, I didn't pay any more than that for it. I was going to ask you about your acoustic guitar preferences. Actually, you've got some solo shows coming up, right? Yeah, yeah, a lot of solo stuff, and every so often. Uh, Drummer who was in the fundamentals, Rob Jones, excellent drummer locally, well, everywhere. Sometimes we do it as a duo, and he just plays percussion stuff. And it sounds kind of neat, you know, this uh, finger picking guitar and uh, rhythm behind it just to get a little oomph. And it kind of works. 
Now, yeah. what's your main go-to acoustic guitar on stage these days? Today, it is a Martin D15 All Mahogany. Nice. Mahogany is, I've been checking it out for about 10 years, and Mahogany to me is a, the best sounding acoustic, from, for my purposes anyway. Uh, it just sounds bright, but it's still got overtones galore. And I understand now why Les Paul wanted mahogany on his Les Paul on his guitar. Because... Well, you know what? I mentioned that I have a custom-built Stratocaster, I call it, and I, it even has on the headstock custom solo caster. And that was one of the considerations I had, is I wanted a mahogany body. You know, I yeah. Know I'm not a big fan of the ash or alder bodies that are usually stock with Fender guitars. Uh, it has a mahogany body, and there's a luthier who was in North Bay, and you might know this guy. I met him when I brought my band home in 2011 uh, and played some shows at Cecil's up there. And, oh, Mike Edwards. Yeah, yeah, and he said, you, you know, know, I love your playing, man, and I'd love to, you know, I'd love to build some guitars for you. And the idea was that he was going to build a guitar for me, and I would play it for six months and endorse it in all my recordings and whatever, and, yeah. uh, and uh, that I'd give him that one back, and he'd build me another one. So the first one was supposed to be a Les Paul. And in fact, I gave the Les Paul I had away prior to that. Huh. Yeah, the guy was in my band for like 12 years, and I just felt like he deserved a nice parting gift after all those years of service to my cause. Anyway, so whatever my reasons were, I'd given mine away. And so he said, I will build you a custom Les Paul, and you give me your specs and so on. And before we could really get into it, he got sick, and then he passed away. Yeah. So I yeah. thought, well, there's not much I can do, you know, and I, I, I can't, you know, what can you do? People die, right? So that was, yeah. it was a nice idea. Anyway, all these years later, it was like two years ago, I was visiting a mutual friend, and he hands me this fretboard, this ornate fretboard with pearl dragon inlays, and it's Korean uh, rosewood. And he said, this came from Mike's inventory. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought, well, this isn't that interesting. What am I going to do with it? So I took it to my guitar repair guy, and, and he's also a custom builder. And he said, well, this would be good on a Strat. And I thought, huh, huh. Yeah. isn't that interesting? Turns out it yeah. was actually an acoustic fretboard initially. Reiner Wiekman is the uh, the luthier that and guitar tech guy, and he ended up building me uh, to my specifications the the solo caster, and it all started out with this fretboard that I had no idea what I was going to do with. Right, yeah, yeah. It's funny how that kind of stuff happens, eh? Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. Yeah, well, uh, I had one of his acoustic guitars for a while, in probably two thousand five. No, no, it would have been after that. It would have been two thousand six. And it was, it sounded really good. It was a, like a dreadnought size, but I found it really hard to play. Mm. The neck wasn't the right shape, you know, but that was probably my preference too, you know. To, but uh, yeah, I still got the, the body downstairs. I don't, I don't use it anymore, but it's still down there. And I guess you, John McGill have... has, uh, has one or two of Mike's guitars that he, he really likes. Maybe he was more hands on with the approach to the design on it. Who is this? No, that's it. John, John McGill. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, Yeah, because John McDonald makes guitars. He makes nice guitars. I don't know how they are to play. I've never played one, but boy, they sound good. They sound real good. He uses weird woods, too, you know, like purple wood and this this odd stuff. But he seems to understand how it works. That's That's interesting, yeah. So what's happening with you these days, Jake? I know you've got some live shows coming up. Yeah, just playing a bit and jamming a bit and freelancing a bit and you know just kind of not as busy as in the past like the last couple of years kind of put a kibosh on pretty well everything and up to that point it has been going pretty steady like the fundamentals have been going for over 25 years throughout the pandemic i just decided uh, i'm not going to bother doing that i'm just going to play some gigs play some house gigs every so often put a band together and play some blues i like playing blues that's what i like to do well, give me three chords and a guitar and turn it up loud and away we go. Well, you're a natural for that, that's for sure. Yeah, I grew up with that when I was like 13, 14. Remember they used to have the, uh, you could order records, you pay six cents and <laughs> yeah. be a record club. <laughs> yeah. And I would, I would order anything with a guitar on the front and I ended up with a bunch of Freddie King and 
D.B. King albums, and I didn't know it was blues or what it was, but I really liked it. Well, Freddie King put out a, an instrumental album with San Jose and uh, the Stumble and all that stuff on it, and somebody took it. I lost it about 10 years ago. I don't know where it went. But it was just killer, and like and it was blues, basically. And the duels, remember Stick Shit? I don't know if you're probably too young for that. That was an instrumental that was just... I think all they had was a drummer and a rhythm guitar player and a guitar player. And this stuff just always stuck to me because it was just raw. Just raw stuff, you know? Like no finesse whatsoever and perfect, <laughs> you know? Well, I was going to ask you who your main influences are. You kind of covered that. Do you have any advice for young guitar players that want to get into the business these days? Uh, learn how to play before you try and make a record. You hear a lot of people nowadays playing into computers and, you know, it takes them two years to put out an EP, you know, and they get a arts council grant or some kind of money to do an album. And, well, first of all, they have no credentials to... I've heard some of this stuff. Some of it's okay, but most of it is, ooh. You know, there's phasing problems. You listen to it and you can hear it phasing. I don't know how you fix that. you got to do it right at the source when you're recording. Things are out of phase. But, you know, like, I had to say practice and get good. Like, John Mayer, I'm not a fan of his at all, but he's a really good player. You know, like a guy like Robin Ford, you listen to him, and he likes jazz, but he, he knew he had to do something a little different, you know, to make a decent living. I guess he wasn't going to be a great jazz player playing a Telecaster on the treble pickup. <laughs> he just, like, that Talk to Your Daughter album, that's just, it's a head turner. Like, it's just incredible. And just listen, listen and learn. And don't be afraid to ask questions because most people will respond positively, you know. Like, I remember a friend of mine in Toronto asked Robbie Robertson, you know, like, how do you bend those strings so much? Like, how do you do that? And rather than saying, well, I use light gate strings, Robbie told him, well, I fried them in butter first. <laughs> <So> <laughs> this guy tried it, and of course it didn't work. <laughs> we all laughed at him and, you know, put a banjo string. Before, all we had were black diamond strings. For a high E, you would buy a banjo string. I forget the gauges. And then move all the other strings in the set down one. So you have an unwound third. The black diamond E string would now be a B string, and the B would be a G. And that's how you bent strings back before you had all these gauges and, you know, this and that and the other thing. It's interesting. Like, that, everything came from a need. You know, all the equipment, all the, uh, everything just came from need, you know, and, it's amazing how people utilize it. Like, I never realized how much the Beatles used capos. They had capos all over the place. Yeah, you know, that was something for me as a, as a kid trying to learn how to play a lot of this stuff. That, yeah. Uh, I, it just drove me crazy. I ended up not only learning the wrong way to play things, but in the most physically difficult way possible a lot of times. And then you see the videos years later, and there they are with capos. I'm like, oh my yeah. God. If we had yeah. YouTube when we were kids, man. Yeah. Well, you know, Stephen Still, Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. Right. That song, I tried to learn that thing when it came out. I spent hours and hours fooling around it, and it never sounded right. And then I found out just a few years ago that the tuning on that is E, 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 B, E. That's the whole guitar, every string is an E. Wow. Except the Whoops. We lost the connection there for a second. All strings in that tuning are tuned to E, except for the B string, which stays tuned to B natural. And that's how he did it. You know, you've got to change the gauges on your guitar so you don't break the neck or it. But that's the sound right there. Try it. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. Wow, that's... <laughs> Bruce Palmer, the bass player of the Buffalo Springfield, apparently he had that tune. He came up with it. And it works. It's, it's amazing. But yeah, little things like that. Tricks, and then all of a sudden, you, Joni Mitchell and all the tuning she used are amazing. No kidding. But, well, listen, Jake, I don't want to take up all of your day here. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me today. And until next time, cheers. All right. Thank you. Well, there you have it. Jake Thomas, I think, was a fine choice for our debut episode of Guitar Talk here on Tommy Solo's Famous Friends. This guy has been around the block so many times, and he certainly does know what he's talking about when it comes to guitars. Now, Jake has some dates coming up real soon. 
Uh, Thursday, April 21st, he is at the Match Eatery and Public House at the Cascades Casino in North Bay. That's an afternoon show. And then he is also there uh, on Saturday the 23rd in the evening. He will be at Lou Dogs in North Bay, May 14th. And again, uh, Lou Dogs in North Bay, June 17th. Now, he also has a show coming up at the Porky Music Festival in Porky Junction. That is July 15th. And then he will be opening for Crystal Shawanda, August 7th, at the Etwell Concert Series in Huntsville. Now, here is Jake and the Fundamentals with their song, Say Something and Mean It. Enjoy. Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a one-man production, meaning that I've done all the work, including guest acquisition, recording, editing, and so on. And hey, if you like the show, why not subscribe and help support us through Patreon at patreon.com slash Tommy Solo. The theme song for Tommy Solo's Famous Friends is a clip from my original composition, The Burn, all rights reserved. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, and until next time, cheers!